Good afternoon. I'm Mary Jano, Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs uh, at Columbia University, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's event held uh, under our Kent Global Leadership Program on Conflict Resolution. As many of you know, this program was founded in late 2019 through the generosity and the imagination of Mutar Kent, former chairman and CEO of the Coca-Cola Company, and it officially launched uh, last December. Its purpose is to advance scholarship on conflict and importantly, to train a next generation of practitioners who will work to address conflict in many forms. And the Kent program also sponsors a visiting scholar and supports students. SIPA has been a place of scholarship, training and engagement around conflict since our founding in the late 1940s whether through the Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies, our degree specialization in international conflict resolution, our deep ties with international organizations and the United Nations, or our very, very expert faculty who consider many sources of conflict, whether arising from poverty, climate, geopolitical or regional <clears throat> tensions or other factors, SIPA is an intellectual hub of activity considering both drivers of conflict and also solutions. That's why it's very special and meaningful for us to be the home of the Kent program and why we are very fortunate to have Jean-Marie Gaino as the inaugural Kent visiting professor. Professor Gaino is a leading practitioner and scholar who has served as president and CEO of the International Crisis Group, as former undersecretary for peacekeeping operations at the United Nations, and formerly as Saltzman Professor of Practice at SIPA. And today he will be delivering our inaugural Kent lecture on the subject, Are We Losing the Battle Against Violence and War? I should say I'm also deeply grateful to him for assuming leadership of the program after the untimely passing of the founding director, Professor Edward Luck. Professor Luck was a scholar, mentor, and friend to so many in our community, and we miss him greatly. For today's event, let me first welcome Mutar Kent. Thank you so much for joining us, who will share some thinking about the Kent program and then invite Professor Gaino to deliver his remarks, followed by a discussion led by Professor Jack Snyder, who is the Robert and Renee Belfer Professor of International Relations at Columbia University, and himself a leading scholar on conflict, who's undertaken pathbreaking work on democratization and conflict, and on civil wars, among other areas. I'm sure this will be a very engaging discussion, Thank you all for joining. And let me now invite uh, Mutar Kent uh, to offer a few remarks as well. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you, um, uh, Merit. And it's a great honor and pleasure uh, for me to be here today um, at this uh, very uh, important event uh, for the program, uh, the conflict resolution program uh, that uh, is um, housed at um, Columbia University. I'm very proud to partner with Columbia University on this initiative. Um, and then how I got here was very simple. Conflict uh, across the world in every dimension was on the rise, has been on the rise. And um, there's um, just very little uh, that, uh, and it, it's been on the rise in an unabated way. And when I refer to conflict, I refer to conflict in, in every sense, uh, social conflict, educational conflict, religious conflict, urban, geopolitical, economic, financial, family, personal. And so um, I thought um, really that um, when I looked around, there wasn't really a program that also focused in a, in a practical way on, on resolution of conflict, or at least uh, the beginning of resolution of conflict. And so for the well-being of uh, future generations, um, I thought we just had to do better than how we've done in the in the last uh, few decades in preventing and, and helping to solve uh, uh, these uh, conflicts. Um, uh, and in the key variance, um, in a way, if, if you like, or the key difference in this program is uh, the use of what I call the golden triangle, um, the golden triangle of business leaders, um, government leaders, uh, civil society uh, leaders 
uh, coming together to um, um, share their experiences with um, uh, young uh, um, civil servants that uh, would be trained by them in, in, uh, in how they've resolved or they haven't been able to resolve conflict, just practical experiences shared by leadership of that uh, golden triangle. And so um, the Kent program in this respect is intended to initiate dialogue amongst the various groups uh, and that it will engage members of the golden triangle and have them share their experiences firsthand with these uh, young diplomats, young civil servants coming from different parts of the world. Um, and each session um, will be um, shared uh, virtually with a wider group. So I'm really very excited. Uh, excited also to have uh, Jean-Marie uh, Guénaud uh, uh, to uh, uh, lead the program and, and to offer his um, vast experiences and also um, second what you said, uh, Merit, in terms of uh, want to express my heartfelt uh, condolences to on the passing of uh, Ed Luck, our first uh, program director, uh, and express my heartfelt condolences to his family and to Columbia at large. Um, with that, I just want to say once again how proud I am to partner uh, with you, Merit, with Columbia University on this exciting uh, initiative. Thank you. Thank you very much. And may I welcome uh, Professor Gaino to offer his remarks. Thank you, uh, Merit. Uh, thank you, Muta, for this very kind introduction. I, uh, I think there's nothing more important than what we are going to discuss uh, in, the next, uh, in the next hour. But as I was preparing that lecture, I was remarking that we have a very hard time giving a name to the period we live in. We can only point to the differences that make it distinct from previous periods. And that's not a good sign. We call, in the, we call it the post-Cold War or the post-post-Cold War moment. It really is the nameless period. And that leaves us confused because it seems to have no defining characteristic. And that may explain when we come to conflict, why we have such difficulties understanding conflict and how to address it. In a remarkable little book uh, titled Is War in European History, the great uh, British historian, Michael Howard notes that I quote, one cannot adequately describe how wars were fought without, uh, without giving some idea of what they were fought about. If today we are not clear about the ideas that are shaping our time, we will also remain confused about the drivers of contemporary conflict and how to address them. And in that sense, uh, what uh, Muta Kent was saying about the, the various uh, shapes of conflict, both the, the deadly conflict and the other conflict is very important because we may learn something also from a kind of harshness that we now see in our societies, which has implications also for deadly conflict. And we can learn from all those experiences. So I'm very grateful to SIPA and to Mutar Kent, whose generosity has made this new program on conflict and conflict resolution possible, for giving me the opportunity to try to address that confusion and bring some clarity. And I would like to start with two personal episodes of my life. The first happened when I was, when as a young French diplomat uh, working on nuclear doctrine, I uh, was shown the core of a nuclear bomb in a military research lab. And I, could, I was so surprised to see that that core was no bigger than, uh, than a tennis ball. And that left me with a, a lasting and almost physical awareness of the enormous concentration of power uh, that, uh, is, that has been ushered by the nuclear age. 20 years later, I had a very different experience, but also a defining experience. I had just been appointed Under Secretary General for Peacekeeping in the United Nations, and I traveled to Sierra Leone, and I was asked to address child combatants. They had committed the worst atrocities, but the instruments of their atrocities, they were not nuclear bombs, they were machetes. Which, which they mutilated thousands of people. And I struggled to connect with them. And it made me realize how precarious a human community is. I was there in front of other human beings who had behaved like, like um, in the most cruel uh, animals could. 
And that gives a sense of the scope of the range of the complexity of the task we have before us when we uh, discuss conflict. If I had given the Kent lecture 15 years ago, the tone would have been very different. The International Criminal Court had just started operating. The new norm of the responsibility to protect which owes so much to visionaries like uh, Gareth Evans and Edward Luck. And uh, I want to jo join Mary Jano and Muta Kent in paying tribute uh, to him today. Had just been endorsed uh, by at the UN summit. A human rights council had been added to the institutional architecture of the UN. And even the so-called new world order of the first President Bush had lost its shine after the Iraq war launched by his son had created deep fractures. But nevertheless, there was still a strong sense of a shared and solid common ground, which allowed the international community to have global ambitions. Today's world is indeed very different. I don't want to idealize the past. And I know that the harsh methods of realpolitik never really disappeared. But what strikes me <coughs> today is the absence of efforts to disguise them. Fait accompli, lies, even assassinations, sometimes seem to be the new currency of politics. Coercion and raw power often seem more relevant than diplomacy and the values of humanity. And uh, there is not uh, much effort to safeguard a framework of international laws and treaties that certainly never truly completely govern international relations, but they did effectively soften them. And whether it is uh, uh, the juice uh, ad bellum, as the jurist would say, I mean, the, the conditions on which you can use force and declare war, or the jus in bello, the, the way you, you manage a war, the, uh, what you call the international humanitarian law, in both situations, we see a serious erosion of, uh, of, of the law. Uh, and that's, that really raises big question. The world of 2021 is a world of diminished hopes. We have to be honest and recognize it. And we are no longer so convinced that we are on a path of indefinite progress. Conflict, sure, has declined after the end of the Cold War. But since 2006 or so, we see that that decline has stopped and maybe has been reversed. When, of course, the conflict of Syria and Yemen have taken a very heavy toll in that respect. And the optimistic narrative, therefore, of the psychologist Stephen Pinker, in two famous books he wrote, The Better Angel Angels, Why Violence Has Declined, and the other book, Enlightenment Now, the case for reason, science, humanism, and progress. Well, in those two books, he argues that the growth of the state has been a break on individual violence. Well, now that optimism can be questioned. Yes, indeed, state power can eventually impose a sort of peace, although sometimes at an enormous cost. Uh, there is nothing to celebrate in Syria where maybe the figures of casualties have gone down in the last uh, two years, but the state has asserted its power over a country that is destroyed. And then there's also the risk of ever more gigantic confrontations between states, as some fear could happen if the US-China relationship is not properly managed. Uh, so sometimes we wonder, whether we are about to experience the worst of both worlds. That is a combination of fragmented violence that is allowed by weak institutions in parts of the world. And at the same time, the risk of a clash or catastrophic confrontation of strong states. These are uh, two uh, extreme ways of thinking about conflict. And we certainly want to avoid both. So to address that, I'm gonna make six points to try to make sense of what contemporary conflict is today, and hopefully to also to offer a way forward out of uh, this predicament that we have with conflict today. My first point is to recognize that interdependence is also vulnerability. The benefits 
of globalized of a globalized planet are well known and i'm not going to to focus on them from trade movement of capital i mean there there are so many benefits that have lifted millions of people out of poverty we could we could uh, spend a lot of time on that and i don't want uh, to to ignore them but talking about conflict we are now discovering the risks of interdependence and they are both material and uh, political the pandemic and climate change are certainly exhibit a and b of our material interdependence uh, i don't need to elaborate much on the pandemic we know that we won't be safe from the virus until everybody is safe because we cannot stop the movement of people forever and with people vulnerable and on the move that gives opportunity to the virus to mutate and to infect us again as for climate change we know that countries which make a minimal contribution to climate change because they have at a very low level of development <clears throat> and in any case can't do much about it are among the hardest hit i'm thinking of the sahel countries where repeated droughts combine with high birth rates to make the situation unsustainable and that inflames pre-existing tensions between herders and agriculturists and it also triggers more migrations that's for the material interdependence our world has become a small place but the political interdependence is the other facet of vulnerability in a global planet we are doubly dependent and vulnerable we depend on others to solve our problems because effect because uh, sorry i'm uh, this phone uh, let me i was going to speak about political interdependence it's the other facet of vulnerability in a globalized planet we are doubly dependent and vulnerable we depend on others to solve our problems because effective responses to a material interdependence require collective political action and we are also vulnerable to the problem of others as they reverberate on our own societies we discover that political dynamics political domestic dynamics are influenced by political de developments beyond uh, our control and you have many examples of that first think of the war in syria that initially triggered moral outrage but let's be honest not much reaction until the europeans found out that the flows of refugees toward their continent could indeed change the political dynamics of europe and weaken it dramatically think of terrorism terrorism has existed for hundreds of years but what is new and makes it a strategic issue is that thanks to the power of media a terrorist act can now reverberate all over the world uh, and that changes the leverage of terrorists uh, over our societies that was obviously the case for 9/11 and is the case for a number of terrorist attacks that have happened in Europe in a globalized world in other word isolation is not an option and there are no islands of peace my second point is that this increased interdependence makes political communities more fragile and if i may say more brittle the links Uh, created by the proximity of geography as important as they still are are under stress we are not sure we can keep control of our future and that feeling of precariousness which used to be limited to the weakest countries now affects the rich ones too for centuries for the vast majority of people the place where they were born was their natural horizon and it was a stable horizon it did not change too much between the time of their birth and the time of their death this is no longer the case the place where one is born often changes more quickly than we do as it is itself subject to a multiplicity of external influences we feel the ground shifting under us and we are often somewhat helpless about it there are several reactions to that and we could discuss the impact of social media on creating small tribes uh, to prevent being drowned in a world that just infringes uh, on on us one possible reaction is nationalism 
a nationalism that is very different from the nationalism of the 19th century or the 20th century, nationalism of overconfidence. Today, the nationalism that we see is a nationalism of fear among people who feel under siege and are not sure they fit in a world that changes faster than they do. But nationalism is not the only response. In a fluid and connected world where territorially based identity has lost its self-evidence and where the confidence in politics is low. And, and there are reasons because why it's low, because politics has, doesn't always has the capacity in an interdependent world to, to, to give all the answers. In that world, other identities, ethnic, religious, even criminal, we see the importance of criminal gangs sometimes in creating a sense of belonging. Other identities assert themselves and they compete to fill the vacuum. And they're often more transnational than international. And that fragmentation and brittleness of national communities has major consequences for conflict. A community that is unsure of its own identity is ripe for manipulation by domestic and foreign political entrepreneurs. And the distinction actually between domestic politics and foreign affairs weakens when the horizon defined by national borders loses its self-evidence. The home front, so to speak, is no longer secure. And that also applies to rich developed countries. My, first, my third point flows from what I had just uh, described. And in a way it's counterintuitive. We would think that with inter interdependence, there would be a push for more global institutions. But what we see is that interdependence does not necessarily lead to greater global engagement and convergence. As all countries become more aware of their own vulnerabilities, they often have an increasingly domestic focus. In a worst case scenario, and we see some example of that, you can conclude that the shortest route to building one's own security <clears throat> is to exploit the weaknesses of adversaries rather than take the difficult and long route of building one's own strengths. There are cases of that kind of strategy. But even if such a cynical approach is rejected, the fact is that in a post-COVID world, many countries will have uh, less resources and less appetite to help stabilize other countries and export, so to speak, stability uh, and peace. This is not all negative. If it reflects a growing, a growing awareness of the difficulties of such enterprises in its different dimensions, from peacekeeping to peace building. This is a, this is a, this is a very difficult uh, thing to do. That greater caution is a good thing if it brings greater attention to and respect for different societies. And a welcome humility, I think, is good for international affairs. But because there was, and I was part of that, there was some hubris in the dreams of the first decade of this century when the international community seemed to believe that society could be almost re-engineered. Um, when I was head of peacekeeping during the, the first decade of this century, uh, the project of peacekeeping became probably too large and too ambitious and too wide ranging. And at the time, the patronizing concept of the fragile state reflected a West centric vision of a nation built on a strong state, itself embodied in a powerful bureaucracy. And if that model, a product of centuries of war could be replicated peacefully in a few decades. We are certainly now more aware of the challenges of transposing a particular historic experience to, proud, to profoundly different context. But the danger is go, we go too far now in the other direction, that the reality check that has destroyed what was in part a dream may now lead to an excessive retrenchment as people hastily draw the conclusion that because not everything is possible, nothing is doable. That is wrong. And I want to uh, use uh, the, uh, the last part of this lecture to explain why it is wrong, what can be done, but also what needs to change so that we do not uh, adopt the council of despair. So my fourth point 
is that in a world where nations cannot isolate themselves from regional, from global, from transnational influences, conflict resolution must also broaden its geographical uh, horizon. Uh, we used to see ourselves as sort of surgeons, which isolate the part that needs to be operated and ignores the rest. We can't afford that. And Syria is a case in point. And so is Yemen, and so is Somalia, and so is Libya, and so is the Sahel, and so is the Democratic Republic of Congo. In all those countries, peace built from the ground up with local actors has to be complemented by regional efforts that embed peace in a stable and reconciled regional environment. Islands of peace are unlikely to stay peaceful if they are surrounded by oceans of war. And much of the pessimism on conflict resolution today is a consequence of the disconnect between the strictly national frame in which we tend to address conflict and the reality of political interdependence. There are a hopeful sign that this approach is changing. Uh, and there is an understanding that now that purely national solutions do not work and that peacemakers must address all levels to be successful. What we see happening in Libya, I mean, uh, where there's now some hope that, uh, of progress, is exactly that. After years of paralysis and conflict, all the tracks, the local, the national, the regional, seem to be progressing in parallel. Nothing is uh, for sure. Uh, nothing is guaranteed, but there is progress there. My next point is that, yes, we need to broaden our geographical horizon, but that's not enough. We need to broaden the range of stakeholders involved beyond political actors, bringing together actors with different motivation, different perspective, different experience. Diplomats, maybe I'm biased because I am one, uh, continue to have a key role to play in maintaining peace, in building trust. But peace is not their property. And it needs coordinated efforts of governments, civil society, business. Without the stability provided by political institutions, no society, no economy can pro prosper. But institutions remain an empty shell without a vibrant civil society that connects people. And if there is not a business community that creates jobs and wealth and also provide a sense of professional belonging, then uh, all these institutions are very fragile. So it is through the interaction between those three categories of actors that a society strengthens its fabric and becomes resilient. But too often, and I have seen that firsthand when I was uh, in charge of peacekeeping, too often these actors don't know how to talk to each other. They don't know how to borrow from each other's experience too. And they have a hard time interacting. And that lack of orchestration dramatically weakens the efforts to resolve conflict. In a networked world like our world is, building bridges between those different worlds becomes imperative to prevent conflict as well to manage it and to solve it. And uh, at the Kent program, and that's why I'm so honored to direct that program now, we plan to look at case studies of prevention as well as conflict uh, resolution to see how this vital relationship can work out, why it fails in some cases, when it succeeds in other, and draw the lessons of success. And the, the United Nations, the creation of the Peace Building Commission has also been an important first step in the recognition that peacemaking and peace building can succeed only if they are multidimensional. And I say that as a former peacekeeper who focused more on the military side of things. My last point is that we need to not only to broaden our geographical uh, horizon, we need to broaden the range of stakeholders involved. We also need to broaden our time horizon and adjust our monitoring accordingly. We need to act early and to address structural issues before they turn into crises, to stop and ideally to prevent conflict before it begins to metastasize. The horizon of politics is a short-term short horizon, but most of the crises I have mentioned are the result of long processes. And when the consequences hit us in the face, we are surprised, but it's often too late. <clears throat> 
We see it for natural phenomena, the pandemics, the climate change that I referred to were long in the making. And the issues have existed <clears throat> and been known to specialists for a long time. And nobody acted on them with a sense of urgency. Although when the crisis strikes, it is often too late to deploy an effective strategy. I think we need to have uh, that same, we need to broaden the time horizon for political phenomena too. The superiority of prevention has become a cliche, but it's not yet, but what is not yet fully accepted is that we don't have the foundations of effective prevention. And I, by that, I mean, we don't have the right sensors to detect those local phenomena that will have global consequences and are the early indicators of bigger things to come. And there it's interesting to, to look at the micro politics and the macro politics, so to speak, to look at the small groups that become hostile tribes in our countries and what that can mean later on at the bigger, at a broader level. That is what we need to do. We do it in the physical world when we monitor a receding glacier in the Alps or ice in the Arctic. We need to give the same attention to the early signs of political decay. Let me now close uh, with a final, on a final thought. <clears throat> Political institutions are failing us because they are overburdened. How then to rebuild confidence and trust? Steven Pinker, to whom I referred earlier, has explained how the growth of the state has brought peace. And we tend to conclude that the biggest a state the better for peace. We need institutions that help connect the world and consolidate shared norms. In that sense, the more global our institutions, the better for, the preven for prevention and elimination of conflict. But rapid reform of existing political institutions, let's face it, is unlikely. And it's probably a mistake to focus exclusively on them. That may be the wrong conclusion. At the beginning of this lecture, I referred to the atomic bomb with its enormous destructive power and to the child, child soldiers that I met in Sierra Leone. These two stories are relevant for our plan of action. Indeed, on the one hand, we absolutely need the global institutions and norms to make nuclear war unthinkable and to address global issues like climate change or pandemics. But we also need, and that's urgent, uh, to build from the ground up human communities with sufficiently strong links that uh, the atrocities committed by child soldiers also become unthinkable. And those institutions and structures in a connected and multi-layered world should not be exclusively political. They cannot be. A world in which identities are distributed among a variety of overlapping communities, territorial and non-territorial, public and private, rather than concentrated in ever more powerful and bigger states, will in, by, will in my view be more resilient and more peaceful. Complexity is good for peace. And that is an enterprise that requires the joint efforts of governments, of civil society, and of business. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Gaino. And um, let me just say, uh, invite uh, our attendees uh, and thank you all for coming. We have a very large group. Please feel free to submit some questions in the Q&A feature as we will get to those a bit later. But let me now invite uh, Professor Snyder to offer some reactions and comments. Thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to engage uh, these fundamental questions of our time uh, with Professor Gaino. So um, I think that the description of our present discontent is uh, right on the target. Uh, I do have questions about the prescription that follows from that, which is very creative and intriguing, but I'm looking forward to it being fleshed out. So Professor Gaino talks about this nameless world of high connectivity, high complexity, and mutual vulnerability. And he tells us we have to learn to live with it because isolation from it is not an option. Uh, in fact, 
to my ear, it sounds like he's saying that we need to learn to prefer it to a world of brittle states and fearful nations. This is a bold statement for uh, someone like Professor Gehena, who's uh, come out of a career where job one of the peace building community that he was so centrally a part of was the construction and strengthening of territorial states through uh, programs of state building, such as the, the UN and the international community uh, rolled up their sleeves and tried to implement uh, over the last decades since the end of the Cold War. Um, but uh, now we're told that um, that project has not succeeded in the way we had hoped, and that instead we need to uh, weave a tapestry of overlapping communities rather than put all of our bets on creating rigid um, state building projects by the numbers, uh, the way we were accustomed to thinking. Uh, instead, we need to uh, embrace the golden triangle, uh, as Mutar Kent was uh, saying, that coordinate government, civil society, uh, business uh, at local, uh, national, and regional levels, uh, despite the fact that, at least in the, the manuscript version, uh, Professor Gano said that these people are now not talking to each other very successfully, and that's one of the jobs, to just get them together to exchange ideas about problem solving. Um, we have to accept the idea of transactional fluidity of this multi-layered uh, transactional world um, which offers some advantage compared to hidebound, inflexible institutions that have turned out to be weaker than we had hoped. Um, we need to understand neighborhood effects, uh, that the success of one country, uh, and research shows that this is a very powerful predictor, the success of one country depends very much on the success of its neighbors. Uh, so local and national efforts need to be embedded in regional networks. So um, this is um, a, a dramatic new, uh, not, uh, not 180, but a shift in priority from the old state building paradigm. Uh, but there's one carryover from the old way of thinking, which is uh, even though our notion of what to do needs to change, we still need to do it really fast. We need to act early. Um, we shouldn't give in to engagement fatigue. Uh, we need to preempt emerging conflicts before they happen. Um, but we just need to do it in a new way by weaving these layered networks. So, uh, it would help me understand exactly what needs to be done by this principle if um, we can have better and more examples of how this sort of a process has worked someplace, even, even if only rarely in the past. Uh, the idea that Libya is today the example of this process going on and making some headway, um, you know, suggests to me that it's interesting to look more closely at what's happening at Libya. But if that's the best example we have, uh, I want to I hear more examples of more dramatic success. Um, you know, frankly, my, my mindset is, is uh, kind of the old school. When I think of examples of success cases, they're mostly the result 
of building accountable national states. Uh, in um, It's admitted that uh, outside of the Western world, the examples of this are relatively few, but there are really good ones like Japan and South Korea and uh, Taiwan. And so I'm wondering if the, the multi-level golden triangle weave a tapestry model is really a substitute for that kind of accountable state building model of success, uh, or whether it's just a kind of temporizing uh, uh, second best strategy that's improvisational uh, until somehow history moves along and uh, creates more opportunities to actually build accountable national states in the Japan, South Korea, Taiwan uh, model, rather than an alternative to that. Uh, so um, I'm wondering whether um, what's wrong with the state building model um, is that um, we just push too hard. Uh, too soon, uh, much in the same way that you say that uh, one of the mistakes of peacekeeping was that we were too aggressive with peace build, uh, peacekeeping, which was supposed to move seamlessly into state building, but we did it in environments like Afghanistan, where um, the the material, the raw materials for that. Uh, built state were just not available. And uh, we, we pushed too hard uh, of that model in a time period and in locations that were just not ready for it. And that maybe we need to think about state building as still the goal, but to think about the methods as not leaning so far forward, but leaning back and creating the environmental circumstances in the international system where uh, the broader international order uh, works hard to defeat the international sources of corruption, uh, works hard to provide more security and stability at the broad international order, uh, heads off a global climate crisis to create a, a setting, it, uh, a big neighborhood, if you will, that'll be more conducive to state building than we were able to achieve with our more intrusive measures in the past. So uh, that's my question, but what I really wanna hear is more examples of uh, successes and what does success look like for these fragile states? Is success Tunisia or is success Rwanda? And whatever your, your definition of success is, did they get that way through a layered uh, tapestry or did they get that way through accountable state building or did they do it uh, with a more authoritarian order keeping technocracy. Um, those, are, those are my questions. I'm eager, eager to, to uh, hear more about your really interesting proposals. Well, thank you for, th thank you for a great, great and fundamental uh, question. Actually, the first book I wrote was called The End of the Nation State. <laughs> uh, and that was written before I went uh, to, to work for the UN and uh, run peacekeeping. And my view today is a mix of the two. I don't see what I've described as a substitute to the state. To the state. I see it as a, as a complement. And certainly when I wrote The Head of the Nation State, the, the, the title was probably a bit glib. Uh, because I, I, and I realized working in, in fragile countries, in challenged countries in Africa and elsewhere, how important for 
the identity and also as a balance to the enormous imbalance of power that exists in the world. Having a state mattered uh, to people. So I'm not saying that the state should just disappear, but I do think that uh, the state cannot do it alone. It doesn't work if it tries to do it alone. And, and that's, that's where I do think that there has to be a much better uh, partnership between state civil society and, and, and business. And you, you, you mentioned several examples. And it's interesting that in the great successes, you mentioned South Korea and Japan, two countries that have a very old identity. Well, the problem of the national identity did not need to be addressed. And sadly, that is not the case of all the states around the world. And what we see and what I, what I, I could elaborate is that in the case of Europe, these nation, national identities that exist in my own country and others, and they have been built with blood and tears uh, over, in a very brutal way. And what we have been trying to do in the, the last 20 years is to take a shortcut and thinking that state that did not have a shared long history uh, could, could acquire it uh, in a matter of, of years. And that, I think, uh, doesn't, doesn't work. And so the, the issue for me, and you, you're asking for examples uh, uh, of success, uh, I do think, so. for instance, Sierra Leone. I mean, there has been a vibrant business community in Sierra Leone. There has been, uh, uh, there has been a civil society that has, that, that has developed. And Sierra Leone today is, is a good example of a state that was really a complete basket case in 2000. And today it may not be the strongest uh, state, but it's, it's a state that, that has made enormous progress. Um, you mentioned uh, Rwanda. Uh, Rwanda is a great success story in the traditional way of a state built with an iron hand. Uh, there is an open question whether uh, that uh, needs to be, I mean, to become more inclusive. Uh, and I do, I mean, I do understand the logic of President Kagame that uh, uh, after the, I mean, the, the the immense tragedy of the Rwandan genocide and the ethnicization of politics uh, to sort of say once and for all that ethnicity would not be uh, uh, would not be the di defining uh, dimension uh, is a, is, a, is a, could be a good response, but it has its own its own issues. When Libya, you're right to raise questions. Uh, Libya is. Uh, is certainly not a guaranteed uh, success uh, today. But when you look at the, at the Libyan process, what is interesting is to see that there's a big economic dimension because it's a rentier state. Uh, and so how, and, it, and in a way, the conflict in Libya has, sort, has been a, sort of self-financed. And, and so there's a big question on how that, uh, the interaction between the, the state of Libya the national oil company and the various players who benefit from that uh, from that enormous uh, wealth, but that is not enough. You need to look further down, and that's what the actually the UN mission uh, did in in Libya, working with, with tribes, working with, with municipalities, building legitimacy for from the ground up, and uh, that was also important. And then, on from a geographical standpoint. We know how Libya has become a theater of rivalry between various countries around it and major powers. And so to succeed in Libya, you do need to combine a sort of traditional diplomatic approach where you put around the table and the countries that have an interest in Libya so that they don't compete over Libya. You need to address the economics of Libya and you need to address the the sort of very local uh, grassroots politics of Libya. And if you address only one dimension, you, you fail. And at the moment, there is a hope uh, that we'll go beyond that and that indeed will address all the dimensions. Uh, thank you so much. That, those were uh, great answers. Uh, Merit, what's, what's our next uh, item on the agenda? Well, thank you very much. I mean, I, I guess I would just like to pick up one point 
uh, and then uh, pick up some questions unless Mutar or Kent would like to intervene. We've got, we've started to get some very good questions, but you know, one of your comments, uh, 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 Jean-Marie, was that we need to pay more attention to signs of early decay. And I thought that was a very interesting point, but let's say we see those signs you know, that sort of then what? Who do we mobilize and what institutions can we call upon? I think you, what I heard you saying is that we, you know, we take this multi-layered strategy informed by local conditions, but cognizant of the inescapable interconnectedness. But I wonder if you have a little bit more to say about what those signs of decay are and mm -hmm. what institutions can be mobilized. And thinking also of the questions that are starting to come in about the UN and uh, and its capacity to be of assistance. Well, the, the the signs you have to monitor very closely how the social media, how the national conversation goes, and there are more and more. And actually, technology there is uh, making huge strides to uh, to to have a much better understanding of the pulse of uh, what's going on in, in a country. Now, how do you react to it? I think the answer starts in the country itself. Uh, and then we, if there is one lesson from the past uh, 20 years, is that the notion that uh, foreigners can shape a country uh, with their actions is, uh, is a very risky and probably unrealistic notion. The, the, the reaction has to be in the country itself. And so what you can do is help actually the country understand itself. I think that's when I was the, the head of the International Crisis Group, actually, I thought that uh, the, the value of uh, the International Crisis Group was that its reports in countries that may not have a strong uh, think tank, a strong press, these reports help the people of the country have a better understanding of what's going on in their country. And that in itself, I think, is, is uh, quite, uh, quite, quite important. Now, you raised the question of the United Nations. Uh, I think that the great challenge of the United Nations today is that it is an organization of states. Uh, and while I would agree with uh, Jack Snyder that indeed states matter, states are relevant and they're not going to fade away and they should not. Uh, and they are great reassurance for people. At the same time, they need, they need as I said, to, to, to work with other stakeholders and that is, that is not something that the UN does very easily. Uh, and it's often awkward. And, and that's where I think uh, it needs to evolve. Uh, it needs to bring in the conversation uh, actors that are not state actors. It has begun to do it when at the Peace Building Commission in the Security Council with so-called ARIA formulas. But this is still not in the so in the DNA uh, of the United Nations, and in, in a world where on many issues you see that non-state actors have a much bigger influence than sometimes and more power than state actors. Uh, think of the power of pharmaceutical companies uh, uh, dealing with COVID. Uh, they are more powerful than many many state actors. You need uh, you need to bring them at the table, and that's that's actually happening, but. It's, it's not so easy to, to arrange. Thank you. Uh, um... Merit, if I may just interject, um, um, one of the, one of the um, people attending, uh, my good friend, uh, Phil Kent, um, mentioned uh, for, um, that, uh, a, and I couldn't agree with him more, that a great example of where uh, non-state stakeholders as well as state came together in a very complementary way to um, really solve a, a major conflict is Ireland, the example of Ireland, um, where I think it's a great example where uh, the, in a way the Golden Triangle um, did uh, function well uh, and, and that there was a sustainable uh, peace that emerged at the end of the tunnel. Um, it's, a, it's a very good example and um, it's not an either or in terms of state and the golden triangle. I think it's a, it's, it's and definitely has to be an and because it just makes then um, the architecture stronger. The base of the building becomes stronger than if we can involve 
um, investment, proactive investment, if we can involve business and civil society working hand in hand uh, with government, with state. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Professor Schneider, would you like to add to this or shall we go on to some other questions? I think you're on. Uh, there, there's some great uh, questions uh, yes, in, in the uh, Q&A. So let's go ahead with those. Did OK, very good. Um, so I, I think you started to uh, speak to one of the first one, uh, a little bit more on the institutional question of the UN speaks to those dimensions uh, that are focused on peacekeeping and yet others on, on prevention. and and that these seem very uh, siloed. Uh, so the question here is, are there any suggestions on how do you break down that kind of silo within a silo problem within an organization such as the UN? Hmm. Well, I think it's a question of culture also within the UN Secretariat. Uh, you have people who have focused all their life on uh, politics. You have people who have focused on development. Uh, and there are few people, and I, I know some of them, who have moved from one area to the other. And they are very valuable because then they can uh, bring a range of experience that their colleagues uh, do, not, do not have. Uh, and I think for, for diplomats, it would be good if they are exposed to also different, different cultures uh, so that they, they, they see different contexts and they can integrate them in their, in their thinking. That's, I think, very, very important. So the whole question of, uh, of training uh, is vital in, in that respect. And uh, we'll have a, a webinar uh, here at Columbia at the, at the end of June. And that's very much what we want to do, uh, to organize that, that dialogue between different categories of stakeholders so that they, they learn first in an academic environment, but then in real life, how you, uh, how you handle different cultures and how you make them benefit from each other. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, your remarks about North Korea or around the nuclear issue has uh, triggered a question uh, about how to design a strategy thinking about evolving the North Korean worldview and the relationship that it could have with the world based on a uh, nuclear threat? Well, North Korea is a, is a country where uh, at the moment, certainly the golden triangle cannot work <laughs> because it's a, it's a closed uh, country. So there is, no, there is no civil society you can reach out to in, uh, in North Korea, nor a business community that would be independent from, from the state. I think one, what has to think about in North Korea is uh, whether the instrument of having ever tighter sanctions uh, really uh, works, because it, it sort of uh, reinforces the regime in its worldview. It lives in its protected uh, bubble. And if you want to move things in a conflict like the North Korean, uh, like the North Korea -ish, uh, conflict, you need to how can I say that? You need to expand the imagination. <laughs> uh, you need to make the Koreans, and in including the Korean leadership, understand that there is another world out there that could be good for them. Uh, if they don't see that, they don't move. So I'm not naive. I do see the necessity to make sure that uh, the life is made hard for Korea to for North Korea to acquire nuclear weapons and that then to develop to develop to develop them even more than they already have, and so sanctions uh, in that sense are very necessary. I question whether they uh, will help change the regime mindset when they pressure the people in the way uh, they do. There's an um, immense humanitarian toll in uh, North Korea to the sanctions. And I don't think that in terms of the perception of the regime, uh, they change much. I think they reinforce the regime in its own view. I mean, the case has been made in a very different way for, for Cuba, that uh, um, the, the, without the, the, the sanctions on Cuba, uh, the Cuban regime would have changed uh, years ago. 
Korea is a different case, a much more, a, a much dangerous uh, case. So I, I, uh, I would not uh, make the comparison, put the comparison too far. But I do think that reinforcing the sense of the bubble, uh, the comfortable bubble in which the Korean leadership lives, is not a strategically a good thing. So uh, let me invite uh, Jack Snyder to comment on this. He's thought about nuclear tensions in Northeast Asia quite a bit, I'm sure. Uh, and of course, uh, if we think about a world uh, of others applying pressure uh, on North Korea, you instantly think of China as a country that has a relationship uh, with North Korea that's uh, more meaningful than any other country. And uh, so what, what can be done to evolve the North Korean worldview? do you think, Jack? Well, I definitely agree with uh, Jean-Marie's point that just tighter and tighter sanctions uh, do not have a terrific track record. I mean, look at Venezuela. I mean, the, the, the country uh, has been uh, obliterated by the efforts of its own government in combination with international sanctions, you would have thought that they would have collapsed long ago, but, but no, it hasn't happened. Uh, sanctions, on the other hand, uh, did bring Iran to the bargaining table. Iran is a country uh, where there are a lot of people that have a lot to lose. And uh, so, you know, the, the fault of sanctions not working there was mostly the Trump administration, not that this, the sanctions of the uh, earlier administrations didn't eventually come to fruition. Um, in North Korea, one of the problems is that uh, they are, uh, they seem to be more afraid of opening up to the outside world and grabbing for the carrot and becoming more like, you know, a regular uh, garden variety, East Asian state led economic development uh, model system, because they realize that there won't be much place for you know, hardly anyone in the North Korean elite in that kind of world because they don't have uh, the skills and the connections and the know-how to really you know, take the lead in that sort of world. So they're more afraid that things will go well than they are, as you say, uh, afraid that things will go badly. And so I, I, I fear that the carrot will be and has been equally ineffective uh, as the stick in that case. Thank you very much. Um, we have an interesting question here about whether, you know, how, how to think more about success. Uh, the question is uh, whether it may not be counterproductive or even a little patronizing to define uh, success along the same kinds of indicators, I assume, meaning across countries. You know, d d definitions of success will vary and uh, we need to think about the steps in between and not just focus on the endpoints, asks the questioner, knowing that peace building uh, processes are gradual. So Jean-Marie Gaino has spent his uh, so many, much of his life on peace, uh, peace building. So uh, tell us how you think about those steps and what uh, a range of success looks like. Uh, well, you know, I, I completely agree that we should uh, we should not be too uh, arrogant when we define uh, success. I think the first the first step towards success is that you can sleep at night without the fear of being killed or raped or suffering some horrible uh, violence. Uh, and uh, there are many situations where even that is not is not there. And so there is an immense progress when that is guaranteed. And that speaks to the point of, uh, of Jack Snyder, actually. When, this, when you see a policeman uh, on the other side of the street, uh, you don't see it as a threat. Uh, you don't see him or her as a threat. You see uh, the policeman as a reassurance. And there are, there are a number of situations where that is not the case. So uh, ha having a state that is not a threat 
is already a, the beginning of success. But obviously, uh, that, is, that, is, that, is, that is not enough. And uh, you, people want a job. Uh, people uh, want to make a living. They want to have a future. They want to have education. They, uh, and so that is a very gradual uh, process. I think it starts with security. Uh, if there is no security, nothing is possible. The schools will be burned down. Uh, the dispensaries uh, will be burned down. The teachers will not deploy because they are afraid of being killed. So security is a starting, is a starting point. But after security, then the, the basics of life. And for that to happen, uh, you need to have a, an economy that begins to work. And frankly, in my experience, that's where we have the, the most difficulties. Uh, because for the reasons I said, when you disarm combatants, uh, you, know, you don't know how to... To, to trigger uh, a, a job boom, how to, 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 to kickstart uh, the economy. So the easy answer is that you recruit them in a reform uh, security uh, force, which makes for a bloated uh, security service, which is not a good thing structurally for, for the country, uh, and uh, which sort of keeps the country in a hole. Uh, but having the kind of micro projects where local entrepreneurs uh, can uh, create jobs, can take some risk in areas that are uh, underserved. That is something quite difficult. I know that, for instance, in Colombia, uh, there has been an effort to, to change the risk calculations for people who invest. And that's very important uh, because uh, the, the business will not go in a particular place if, it, if it, there's not a return on, on, it, on, on the investment. And so creating those mechanisms so that then in a very decentralized way, um, entrepreneurs can create jobs, that's a long-term uh, success. And then there is, of course, the issue of democracy and what we mean by, by democracy. Um, I've come to think that what matters is that people sense that their authorities are accountable, that they deliver, uh, they deliver the basic services, that the, the mechanisms of de democracy, sometimes we focus too much on the mechanism rather than the substance of democracy. So indeed elections are important because that's the way you can get rid of a government you don't trust. But elections, uh, they are only a very small part of, uh, of the accountability equation. Uh, because they can be they can be manipulated, uh, they can be hijacked by dominant group. Uh, so there's a variety of ways in which elections are not necessarily the yardstick of a functioning uh, democracy. What you have to create is accountability starting at the local level. And I am struck, and that in my view that has been a failure of the United Nations that we usually start with the national level. That's what was done in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, for instance. And I think it's much better to, to start building accountability mechanisms at the local level, because that's how you build trust in society. Thank you very much. I appreciate those, uh, those remarks. Um, the, um, I know that uh, Professor Snyder has to teach and leave us. So thank you so much for being with us today. I really appreciated your comments. Uh, I enjoyed and, it. Yeah, thank uh, you. Um, and, uh, you know, we have quite a few uh, more interesting questions here. And I think, um, uh, let me just point up two. Um, uh, one is getting at the point you're making, uh, uh, Professor Gaino, which is how do you make the process more inclusive? And uh, you're talking about how you, you know, you have to have job creation, you have to have conditions where business will come in. But there's also a lot of, of focus on, on, on increased inclusivity around, uh, 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 around peacemaking and creating societies uh, that are more just. I wonder if you have any insights or comments around whether there are processes or approaches that have uh, thought of this from an inclusivity dimension and, and it could be linked, but perhaps not, uh, uh, is also the question of mediation itself and whether or not you see uh, mediators uh, uh, shifting their approaches 
uh, in light of uh, changing characteristics of conflict. I think we have time for only a couple reactions. And if I could invite you to offer any thoughts you might wish on, on those two dimensions. Well, I think inclusivity makes a peace more sustainable uh, you, and, and stronger. And, and it can help enormously a peace process, as you, as you can see, for instance, in Liberia, the fact that the women in the Liberian peace, peace process played a, a critical role, that was really very important. They put pressure on the combatants uh, to come to, to an agreement and they helped shape uh, the agreement. And without them, that would not have happened. Uh, at the same time, inclusivity has to be, to be managed because the more inclusive you are also, the longer it takes. And the international community, and that's one of its failings, is often impatient. Uh, and so I remember Lakhdar Brahimi, one of the best uh, mediators that the UN has had, saying, if you want to go fast, go slowly. Uh, by that, he meant that you, you need to, to talk to a lot of people to bring them, bring them under the tent. And that will, that will slow down the process. The, the ceremony with the big photo opportunity will happen later. But when it happens, it will have a much better chance of being a success than if you make a quick and dirty deal with those who have guns. And of course, you need them. You need to have those who have guns. You need to talk to them. You need to have them at the table. But you need to build a process so that gradually, sometimes, they are not the only ones at the table. And each process is unique. But this is that progress where eventually you broaden the tent that is essential to the long-term success of a peace process. Thank you very much. Um, let me thank uh, Mutar Kent for being with us, uh, Professor Gaino for this very broad ranging, comprehensive, uh, uh, provocative uh, set of remarks. Let me thank our audience and I hope that you will come back uh, to uh, next activities undertaken by the Kent program and also many of the themes we have taken up here today. Uh, in the next two weeks, uh, we'll have a, a keynote address by um, a number of, another member of our uh, distinguished visiting uh, faculty, uh, Ambassador Chris Hill, who will be speaking about what role for diplomacy in conflict. So I think, uh, you know, SIPA is a place that continues to engage multiple di dimensions. Professor Gaino, Mutar Kent, any final words? Thank you. Uh, no, just thank you for, uh, for this wonderful speech, uh, Jean-Marie, and, and thank you, Merit, and thank you to all the attendees. Um, a good, a very intellectually stim stimulating uh, um, last hour and 10, 15 minutes. Thank you all very much for joining us today.